our galaxy is beyond immense, containing more stars than every human who has ever lived, and even more planets than that, and yet it is but a tiny dot compared to the universe, and to reach that vastly larger realm we will need to contemplate voyages between the galaxies themselves. Prior to about a century ago, we didn't really know what the difference between the galaxy and the universe was, that our observable universe is something like a million times wider and a billion billion times greater in volume. It is the difference between a room and a building and our entire planet. However, in terms of space and civilizations, we often still tend to use the two interchangeably, talking about getting out into the galaxy and colonizing it. I think that in the past it was just assumed that the galaxy all on its own was so huge we would never colonize it all, and that it probably had at least a handful of other civilizations we would need to share it with. So even greater journeys to other galaxies that probably already were populated by aliens didn't seem worthwhile to contemplate. Nonetheless, there's a very good chance this galaxy contains no other intelligent life, and neither do any of the galaxies near us, our local galactic group, or the Council of Giants which surrounds us. Indeed, even if the known universe contained 10,000 other civilizations like our own, or order, it would still mean something like 200 million galaxies per civilization each of which contains billions and billions of stars. As we'll see today, the process of claiming those galaxies, many of which would be billions of years of travel away, is an enormous feat, and yet one that could potentially be accomplished. Now as usual, we will be assuming that faster than light travel and communication is not available, but we should put a caveat there. If FTL is possible, it is very hard to imagine it won't have been discovered by the time we reach the edge of the galaxy hundreds of thousands of years from now, and that tech definitely does change the equation if you've got it. Or it keeps it the same but with a different boundary. Many hypothetical FTL methods occur at a fixed maximum speed, like warp at 100 times the speed of light, or a wormhole gate that has to be built initially at sublight speed or they go through a parallel universe or hyperspace that's congruent to our own, and which is a thousandth the size or in which light moves a thousand times faster. One of our big problems with interstellar empires is how you could hoard a civilization together when it's separated by thousands of years of travel and communication lag, and even if you could keep it together for decades of such lag, a FTL device that operates thousands of times faster than light does suddenly makes a galaxy-spanning empire somewhat more plausible. It also means intergalactic lag times, while still immense, are more in the zone of what we normally anticipate for interstellar civilizations. Whether it is next year or next century or 10 minutes before the last star dies off, I don't think we will ever have FTL. Nonetheless, I thought we would discuss a few of those options today, along with how they would impact things as we go, even if our main focus will be on sublight speed travel. No object with mass can move at the speed of light, just get ever closer to it as you add more energy to it. You've probably heard reasons why on many occasions, so let me offer two lesser known explanations for those who have heard why before but didn't find it intuitive. First, mass, or inertial mass, is the specific quantity that resists being shoved to higher speeds, or acted against to slow down, what resists us as we push or pull. It is all about resisting changes to its velocity and it requires energy to make that happen, that's what it's doing here. The thing is, while we prefer these days to refer only to something's rest mass, the mass it has when not moving, under classic special relativity, as something speeds up it gets more massive, and conceptually, all that kinetic energy you've added in order to speed things up is now additional mass resisting being shoved even faster. You could think of an object as a wheelbarrow with some initial mass when it's just sitting there for the wheelbarrow's frame and tires. As you add speed, you add mass to that wheelbarrow, making it harder to push. Eventually you end up with a mountain there on that wheelbarrow, and you can always push it faster with a bit more effort, but it starts getting rather pointless. The more full your wheelbarrow gets, the more likely it is to be hard to push, as it might be more likely to flip over, crack the axle, or flatten the wheel too and at very fast sublight speeds we get similar issues. Ramming into a grain of dust can be like hitting a big bomb, and one that you have no time to detect or dodge, as you're moving tens of thousands of miles per second. 
The other thing is that things which have mass or rest mass experience time, things which do not have it do not experience time. A photon of light can travel at light speed, but its internal clock does not tick. It gets emitted and one day may also get absorbed, in a nanosecond or several quintillion years there was no passage of time between those moments. Only things with mass experience time, and the larger the percentage of their total energy is their mass or rest mass, the faster time moves for them. Something that is not moving and has no significant heat or spin energy is something that is experiencing essentially 100% of normal time flow. If it is moving relativistically and has half of its energy as kinetic energy and half as rest mass, then it experiences 50% of normal time flow. Ultra relativistically, maybe 100 times the kinetic energy as rest mass and it experiences just 1% of normal time flow, one minute passing for every 100 that those outside experience. And yes, we have tested this in the lab many, many times. The object being accelerated to ever higher speeds never stops having that rest mass, no matter how much more energy you throw in, any more than the wheelbarrow ceases to exist no matter how much other mass you threw in it, so it never stops experiencing time and never quite reaches the speed of light. Now that's a theoretical maximum and in theory nothing stops you from reaching a billion to one ratio of kinetic energy to mass, where a billion light year trip would feel like only a year to those on board. Something explored excellently in the classic sci-fi novel Tau Zero, however there are all sorts of practical barriers to getting to that speed and this ranges from how you supply that energy to how you avoid the damage that would be done by essentially running into a nuke every time you hit a grain of dust in space at that speed. But we have one more fundamental maximum that is very important to intergalactic travel. The intergalactic medium is not empty. Space is not a vacuum and even intergalactic space still has stuff in it, which is very important for our discussion today, but it is pretty empty and we can get away with far higher speeds than we travel at today, or would inside a solar system or even interstellar space. Given that intergalactic travel is a massive undertaking that might draw on galaxy scale resources to be launched, an intergalactic voyage might be able to get away with tens of thousands of light years worth of pushing relays serving as its launch ramp and getting it to 99.9% of light speed, or higher. But there is one thing which is present everywhere in the universe and that's the cosmic microwave background radiation. These are ancient photons that are the last relics of a period when the whole universe was dense and hot enough that it was basically a star. And as the universe expanded we reached a critical tipping point where photons no longer got emitted and were nearly instantly reabsorbed, but instead tended to be able to travel uninterrupted, and in many cases they never got reabsorbed even almost 14 billion years later to the present day. Those were much brighter photons in the past too, they have redshifted from visible photons all the way through the infrared spectrum and now to microwave. Far, far in the future, they will be redshifted down to the radio range too. However, if you're moving through space at, say, half the normal rate of time flow, which isn't until you're at fully 86.6% of light speed, then those CMB photons are going to blue shift back up by a factor of 2, and from just under 2mm wavelength to about 1mm, and a frequency jump from 160 gigahertz, much higher than your Wi-Fi signals of 2.4 or 5 gigahertz, to about 320 gigahertz. Which also means they just doubled in energy and you are running into them now and every one that you hit is slowing you down a bit. Speed up yet more and the photons will keep blue shifting, eventually becoming visible light again and carrying vastly more energy than they used to. So essentially, at a certain time factor or speed, which we calculate to be a bit over 100, even in empty intergalactic space, the red-shifted and now blue-shifted photons left over from the Big Bang era are slowing you down. So the fastest you can plow through even intergalactic space, probably being shoved from behind by a massive pushing laser, is still going to require you to take 2 million years to get to the Andromeda Galaxy 2 million light years away and is still going to feel like 20,000 years to those on board. Still, that is definitely in the doable range of what we have contemplated. You could probably also burn off most of your kinetic energy as you approach your target by expanding massive mirror arrays to bounce more photons off your front. As always with space travel, slowing down is as hard as speeding up. 
indeed more so because you do your speeding up near home with all the knowledge and resources of your civilization sitting right there. Now this is SFIA so we are willing to consider options that might seem insanely over the top, and such being the case, we might imagine building a massive shielded tunnel between two galaxies to keep the CMB radiation out. This might be some big wide pipe with millimeter thick walls that ships just moved down. You might already have such freeways built throughout your galaxy in order to allow fast or safe travel as there's even more ambient radiation to run into and space dust. Such a project is beyond huge, literally bigger than a galaxy in span. But an aluminum tunnel 10 kilometers in circumference and a millimeter wide contains about 27,000 tons of aluminum per linear kilometer of tunnel or more like 2.5 times 10 to the 20th kilograms per light year. 250 billion megatons. And that means a tunnel 2 million light years long would mass around 5 times 10 to the 26 kilograms. That's a lot of aluminum, not that we couldn't use other materials too, but keeping scale in mind, that's only about the mass of Saturn. In a galaxy that masses trillions of times what Saturn does, such an intergalactic pipeline freeway system would really be no more ambitious than a continent spanning highway route, so if you ever wondered what projects a Kardashev 3 civilization might get up to, that's a real possibility. And as usual, welcome to SFIA, where we're scrapping hundreds of planets just to turn them into aluminum foil for one big freeway is not considered a particularly impressive task. Indeed it would be fairly minor even just for today's material. Trickier than it sounds though, since galaxies are even less static in position than stars are, and only our nearest few neighboring galaxies like Andromeda are actually staying still or getting closer, most galaxies are moving away from us very fast. Indeed the majority of galaxies are moving away from us faster than light speed, and we can only see their ancient redshifted ghost remnants from billions of years ago because they were not moving away that fast back then. As to why I just got done saying most of the universe moves away from us faster than the speed of light, and just a few minutes before that said nothing can move faster than the speed of light, see our episode The Edge of the Universe for explanation of why that is not a contradiction. This is our other big issue for intergalactic travel, because for every billion light years away a galaxy currently is from us, we need to be going an extra 7% of light speed faster just to counter the extra speed they have away from us from Hubble Shift as the Universe expands. Also while individual stars, even in dense star clusters, are like tiny dots in a big black sea, galaxies are more like island archipelagos. One might be a million light years from a neighbor, but 100,000 wide itself, not like a star, which might be a million kilometers wide, but trillions of kilometers from a neighbor, and planets are similarly hugely spaced out. So unlike staging up from global travel to interplanetary travel, or from interplanetary travel to interstellar, the jump to intergalactic isn't that much bigger, and with two interesting notes. First, while you are probably used to hearing Andromeda as the closest galaxy to us, If you actually pull up a list of neighboring galaxies, you will find Andromeda isn't number 1, but way down on the list, number 86 on the one currently up on Wikipedia, though exact position is changing and debatable. You'll also see a ton of other places called Andromeda in about the same place on that list, and that's because our galaxy and most others around these days are monstrous cannibal agglomerations of dozens of other dwarf galaxies, and we've gotten much better at spotting them amidst the wider galaxy these days. Second, we've gotten much better at spotting galaxies in general these days, and thus we don't talk about our galaxy and its two satellite dwarf galaxies, the large and small Magellanic Clouds anymore, because neither is really all that noteworthy as our knowledge has expanded. There are currently a few dozen satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, known to us, that are further from the core than the Magellanic Clouds, and another dozen listed half a million to just over a million light years from us. And we will probably discover many more. They are often the dim, stripped out remains of some small or early galaxy that passed through the main Milky Way and got most of its stars and gas nebulae poured off. Some tiny dwarf galaxy is still huge though, and some remnant core like that in deep intergalactic space may easily contain many millions of stars, even if it is considered tiny by astronomical standards. 
Both the Milky Way and Andromeda have a bunch of these dwarf galaxy satellites, and indeed the two and their satellites are really more of a dumbbell shape making up the local group of galaxies, with the Triangulum Galaxy as a distant third place of a major galaxy, and like Andromeda it will eventually merge with our galaxy. Emphasis on dumbbell though because there is an approximate corridor of stars and gas between us and Andromeda that make a journey between them having a lot more landmarks along the way than intergalactic space generally has. You could have a fairly impressive collection of colonized star systems between the two serving as waypoints. Galaxies are not really spread evenly in space in general, and the next step up of our local group of three major and 80 or so minor galaxies is called the Local Sheet, one wall of the Local Void, a giant empty volume we are near, and we call it the Local Sheet as it's more of a flat plane than a big bubble of space, about 35 million light years across, and dominated by a rough ring around us of what is called the Council of Giants, 12 large galaxies, 10 spiral and 2 elliptical, the nearest of which is the Sculptor Galaxy, 11 million light years away, with its own satellite galaxies called the Sculptor Group, and a central black hole estimated at 5 million solar masses, just a bit bigger than our own core black hole, Sagittarius A. The furthest is the Black Eye or Evil Eye Galaxy, M64, about 17 million light years away. While they are not gravitationally bound to us like Andromeda and Triangulum, all the Council of Giants are moving away from us very slowly, generally about 300 kilometers per second, a thousandth of light speed, and even the Evil Eye Galaxy is only moving away a bit faster. Thus it is not much of a drift and as we discussed in Fleet of Stars, that is actually reversible with sufficient brute force. Ships arriving at the Council of Giants 20 million years from now, which is probably the right zone for when this will happen, could have each colonized fully inside a million years and make the necessary modifications to get those entire galaxies moving back toward us. Indeed we could probably pull this off anywhere inside our wider supercluster of Virgo or Lanakia, maybe even the entire KBC Void, which if you didn't know is an immense and relatively empty region of space in which our own galaxy and most of the Lanakia supercluster sit and it is a rough sphere about 2 billion light years across, which the Milky Way is a few hundred million light years out from the center of. Not to be confused with the smaller, if enormous, local void, which is only 150 million light years across, and essentially is a void inside the larger supercluster and KBC void. For comparison think of seas or bays compared to oceans, and the rather arbitrary boundary between them. Folks often get the impression that cosmic voids are empty of galaxies, they are not. We are one such example as are the roughly 100,000 other galaxies in it. That is also why people hypothesize they might be massive civilizations that have gone dark inside Dyson swarms, that could easily be the case except they wouldn't go dark just infrared, and we still have tons of stars inside these places, like our own, that we can see. We usually mean even more remote galaxies when we refer to void galaxies though. Pisces A is an example of a void dwarf galaxy and is about 18.4 million light years away, and emphasis on dwarf because it is only around 10 million solar masses, compared to roughly a trillion solar masses which is how much all galaxy or Andromeda mass, so we are 100,000 times as massive as that dwarf, and that's not particularly small for a dwarf either. As a reminder, our Sun is exactly one solar mass, and it is bigger than most stars, but most of the galaxies tend to be nebula gas and dark matter. In between galaxies are tons of loose stars too, I've heard numbers as high as 50% of all stars being intergalactic rogues that are not gravitationally bound to any galaxy, though I am skeptical it's anywhere near that high. And we need to keep in mind that while Andromeda would be our first real galactic target, even though many dwarfs will doubtless be sooner and easier, that bridge of stars makes it easier too. It is important to understand the real layout of the cosmos in order to discuss traveling to the various landmarks in it. We're not really talking about getting to our nearest neighbor today. If we wait a few billion years, Andromeda will simply arrive, and there are several dwarf galaxies closer, not even including many inside our own galactic main body. Rather it is about trying to reach out to those further galaxies, the Council of Giants and beyond, 
and it asks the questions of whether we're hopping from one place to another, ever or further, as we often imagine with interstellar colonization, or if every intergalactic colonization mission is launched from this galaxy, and indeed from the relatively small inner sphere of a few hundred light years around us. The question is how fast we need to launch, and my thinking is there's really no advantage to seeking to exceed 99% of light speed. At that speed every clock is running seven times slower and your trip to the Sorcinus Galaxy, one of the Council of Giants on the opposite side of Andromeda, about 14 million light years away, takes 2 million years from your perspective on the ship. And if we're going to be honest, that's about the only perspective that matters for long. I don't care how much you extend the human lifespan, if you're on a multi-million year journey through a genuine void in space, you are a divorced splinter of humanity. This is far beyond what it looks like at the galactic stage, where even in remote regions of the galaxy you would still have many hundreds of neighbors within a light century of you feeding you information and entertainment, that was no more out of date than most of our literary classics these days. Even in the Galaxy Bridge case, where you might have an immense relay of power beaming systems pushing on ships between a galaxy, we might expect a gap of a thousand light years. But this is all assuming we're using stars as relays, and we have to be mindful of the sheer amount of time and resources involved here, not just in the sense of what an extraordinary draw on both is involved in such an intergalactic voyage or highway, but in terms of all the options on the table once you open that door to truly deep space and time. In our original intergalactic colonization episode some years back, we had the finale for our recurring fictional crew of the starship Unity as they took a multi-century pause in the Terminus system at the edge of the galaxy and prepared to launch across the intergalactic void. There we suggested they would be building an immense Nikol Dyson beam system to push their ship up to 99% of light speed, and that ship was likely to be huge, a thing dwarfing any prior spaceship and probably attended by an enormous fleet coming with it. I think the reality of an intergalactic expedition might dwarf even that, but I'm going to propose that it's the launch of thousands of them, and to galaxy groups more than galaxies individually. You don't launch to an individual galaxy but rather to the collection of a handful of major galaxies and dozens of minor ones all bound together by gravity. And in many cases, as we expand beyond our local group and the Council of Giants, many of those targets might actually have merged by the time your fleet arrives. You also might need to be ready to devote entire armadas en route to colonize some tiny dwarf void galaxy because while a few million stars might not seem like much compared to the trillion your typical gravitationally bound galaxy group might have, it is still a million stars. That's also a journey where you'd seriously need to contemplate beforehand what you are going to do if you arrive and find that no trespassing signs are now staked out in front, because during your hundred million year journey that galaxy went from empty except for one planet with basic animal life to a galaxy spanning civilization. It is also quite likely your fleet will be passing in the eternal night past other fleets from other alien empires. Whether or not alien life, intelligent alien life, is so common our galaxy has several examples, or so rare that even the grabby alien scenario of thousands of empires universe wide is a bit generous, you have every motive to spread as far as you reasonably can, and so do they. So if you can build spaceships able to move 99% of light speed, there are billions of galaxies still in our reach if we launch them in the next few million years, and older empires would have had even more. Those massive intercluster armadas are not really passing each other, they likely wouldn't come within 10,000 light years of each other, even if moving between the same two galaxies, and that doesn't imply any ability to carry on a conversation, or even necessarily know they existed. There is nothing subtle about plowing through space with an enormous fleet at 99% of light speed, but it is still a huge volume, and also it's hard to do much astronomy at that speed because there would be lots of noise. We are definitely not expecting any attempt to stop and throw punches at each other either, more likely you would be requesting a letter of introduction for when you arrive so that the enormous galaxy spanning mega civilization there might find you an empty star to call your own. Galactic empires probably aren't stable things over millions of years, and they probably consider you no more of an alien than most of their distant neighbors who share ancestry from their homeworld. 
Except you have databases full of cool and unique data from your home galaxy. And you're also not a threat and you're probably an isolated incident. However commonly alien intelligence evolves, it probably does keep spreading till it bumps into others and should do so in every direction eventually, but probably along fronts a billion light years wide. There's no war along that stretch because there's no unity of culture either, or there's millions of wars but contained to isolated and unrelated conflicts. The lone exception to that would be if we had instant FTL travel or at a speed so fast as to essentially be permitting intergalactic travel in days or maybe years, not geological epochs, and that is entirely possible if FTL exists at all. Nothing says that you can only break the speed limit by a couple orders of magnitude, or that if you can break it at all, breaking it a ton is any harder, especially if it was something like a wormhole network where you had to reach it at sublight speed but once there could create an instant portal back home. In cases like that, empires definitely do go back on the table, and that version at least doesn't usually exacerbate the Fermi Paradox much, since it still requires a slow spread. In that case though, you could have galactic empires, and even supercluster sized ones, and wars between them when they ran into each other. In the absence of that, your best bet is going to be to run your ship up to speed along a long chain of laser highway pushing devices, and I think you're going to make that as long as you can convince neighboring systems to go in for it. Longer is better, but you do get diminishing returns, so realistically I think maybe a few hundred light years is your practical limit to organize and incentivize participation, and thus something Earth itself might opt to be the center of. It is entirely possible that Earth, and the solar system in general, will remain the big titan of the galaxy for several more millennia and be in a position to arm twist its daughter colonies for hundreds of light years around, especially for the purpose of coordinating big, mutually beneficial or prestigious projects. So a massive laser pushing system between each nearby star, possibly complete with swept out tunnels allowing safer neolite speed travel, might get itself built in the next few millennia and it would probably not be that hard to arrange for that to allow intergalactic launches, especially as that might help subsidize early expansion of that highway to places that might not merit that capacity yet, but would inherit it after the launches. A hundred light years is a very big ramp and it is entirely plausible you might be shoving with energy beams able to push planet-sized ships up to speed. Indeed it is very likely the sail array the ship would be using would be planet-sized, even if the ship itself was far smaller. So how big does such a ship need to be? This is tricky because what we really mean is how small we can get away with and there are a lot of variables there, including crew size, which might be a lot of uploaded mines running in ultra slow time, indeed your entire armada of colony fleets being sent to millions of different galaxies might have the same crew, just copies of the same million volunteers or various permutations of a large fraction of that. Is the ship the size of a car or the size of a planet, or is it an actual liberated star system hurled into deep space by one of the star drive systems we discussed in our episode Fleet of Stars, able to use the star's own power to turn an entire solar system into a spaceship? On the one hand, that is the minimum size we know of for a spaceship able to survive hundreds of millions of years, not just our planet Earth floating through the void of space but its larger power system, our Sun. This is really feasible too, though I think a binary system with a black hole and a donor star might work better. You could feed liberated matter via star lifting from the one into the other and achieve possibly as high a speed as 20 or 30% of light speed. Such a method could move a whole star system through intergalactic space and to places as far away as perhaps 4 billion light years. You could settle a whole supercluster using that technique, and far faster than a simple shikata thruster or helios drive might allow, but it's still probably a slow option. Also clunky, in a case like that I'd rather have a black hole directly turned into a ship in a Matrioska shell world built around it that we were firing beams of matter or pods of matter at from behind as it left the original launch region to fuel up and get up to speed. This particular approach still works if we're shining mega lasers onto it to speed it up too, and all the more so because even if it is a planet, you still need a protective shell around it as you get to very high speeds, because of all that radiation and relativistic dust. 
Such a massive sphere could be the size of a natural black hole, indeed you might repurpose an existing one, a few solar masses, or a million Earth masses, or it might be a micro black hole the mass of a modest asteroid. It might actually be several micro black holes that are sized so as to hit their peak Hawking radiation when you arrive at the destination galaxy, giving you a power supply to slow down with. In all cases you are probably using a mothership for the intergalactic crossing, then probably dispatching a smaller vanguard to slow down and gather energy and raw materials to help build the infrastructure to slow the mothership down when it arrives. As we discussed in our episode The Million Year Machine, there are some methods for potentially keeping machinery intact and asleep for such a voyage, in which case even relatively small ships running on fusion might make intergalactic voyages and wake at the other end to thaw out crew or recreate them from digital backups. How much you trust your AI is obviously very important, as well as your engineering, because if you can make stuff that just plain doesn't break from sitting in the void for a hundred million years, then you can use even a fairly simple radioisotope switch to turn everything back on at the right time. Trusting intelligence, man or machine, is definitely tricky. After all, your ship left millions of years ago, longer than recorded human history, longer than any reasonable definition for humanity in terms of age of the species. If you sent a planet cocooned in protective layers and with a fake sun shining down on it, powered by a black hole in the basement, how many empires rose and fell inside that thing during a journey just to the Council of Giants? How many buried layers of earlier human civilization are on that planet ship, and how often do they flat out forget what their mission was? How many religions have arisen when they partially rediscovered that mission and thought it was a 40 million year exodus in the desert of the extragalactic void? How many times have great councils been called or wars been fought trying to figure out how to speed up, change course, stop, or turn around? How many collective centuries of warring have people had that they might arrive at a once empty galaxy only to find it full and possibly very hostile? And a quarter of a million years out, when you pick up signals of an emerging interstellar empire that is claiming the place, what do you do? Send a message asking for a small corner to call your own? And tens of thousands of years for a reply, likely as you're already reaching the galaxy's edge, as you're traveling so close to light speed that you chase on the heels of your own message. What if that reply is a wall of space mines tearing your ship to pieces? If the timing is right, you might be in a position to fight them for it, arriving partway through their own colonization of their native galaxy, or maybe they're the vanguard of an intergalactic colony fleet too. Even if you got there when it was colonized, you might still negotiate or fight for a small chunk of it, again they're not likely to be unified galaxy-wide. Intergalactic colonization will be like no journey humanity has ever made before, but the one thing it will have in common with other great explorations is a lot of doubt and uncertainty, and a need for people of bravery, risk takers, and vision. We have a couple show announcements coming up in a moment, one very major one, but first, an awful lot of how we colonize the universe is going to depend on which, if any, of the various theories on the origin and fate of the universe turn out correct. Heat death, big crunch, big rip, or maybe something entirely different. One of the newer and more fascinating ones is conformal cyclic cosmology, a scenario for potentially surviving the death of this universe or a prior one, and we recently did an episode on that topic exclusively over on Nebula, my streaming service. We have a lot of bonus content on Nebula, from extended editions of episodes to early releases and exclusives like Planet Sources Megastructures or our Coexistence with Alien series. All of SFIA's content comes out on Nebula a few days early and ad-free too, so you can enjoy the episodes as intended. It is a streaming service started by creators for creators and their audiences, and has grown to be the largest creator-owned streaming service, no YouTube algorithms penalizing content or dumping badly matched commercials on you, and using my link and discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during this episode, and it goes to supporting new content from myself and other creators, like our new feature, Nebula Classes, so it's two for the price of one. 
When you sign up at my link, go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur, and use my code, Isaac Arthur, you not only get access to all the great stuff Nebula offers, plus now classes, you also be directly supporting the show. So if you'd like to join Nebula today, and see SFIA episodes early and ad free, just click the link in the episode description, go.nebula.tv slash Isaac Arthur. So we have a couple of announcements for today, one very big one. Long time viewers might recall that just before COVID hit I had the honor to receive the National Space Society's Pioneer Award, and that I gave a talk at the International Space Development Conference last year. I was looking forward to continuing involvement with the NSS, as it's been the largest civilian pro-space group for a couple generations now, and critical to keeping the flames lit on enthusiasm for space exploration and development. The NSS is home to a lot of folks who have been my inspirations and role models for the show, and has been helping forge and shape space policy since even before its official formation. I was not expecting to get caught up a few weeks back to ask if I consider serving as the organization's president, and I was unanimously elected to the position, effective immediately, March 1st. Since it's both a recent and unexpected surprise, I will probably discuss it more after I've settled in a bit and gotten my footing. Needless to say it is a huge honor, and one I'm looking forward to, and I know there are a lot of NSS members here in our audience, so thank you again for entrusting me with it. For non-members, if you've ever thought about joining the National Space Society, or finding one of its local chapters to attend, I'll put the link in today's description. Also for anyone living in the Pittsburgh area, I will be back at the Carnegie Science Center on Friday March 10th for their 21 plus night focused on Mars. It is aimed as more of a casual cocktails and chat night, but I will be giving a few brief talks throughout the evening, as will Bruce Bannert, the Principal Research Scientist on NASA's InSight mission to Mars, and Geologist Michael Ramsey, the head of the University of Pittsburgh's IVIS lab focused on using satellites to study Martian volcanoes and lava flows. I'll link that event in the description too if you'd like to attend. Speaking of upcoming events, we have our Sci-Fi Sunday episode coming up this weekend, March 12th, to explore how we might mitigate major catastrophes or rebuild civilization afterwards, and while normally we focus our eyes on the future, and up above on the galaxy, next Thursday we'll be turning our eyes downward into the past, as we look at the future of archaeology and some of the amazing technologies that will help us learn more about humanity's history. Then the week after that we'll take a look at the concept of simulated universes and how we might hack or escape them if we're inside one. And three weeks from now, on Sunday, March 26, we'll have our monthly livestream Q&A before closing out the month of March on March 30th with our two-hour special, The Advanced Spaceship Drive Compendium, where we'll take a look at nearly a hundred different star drives, from existing tech to the entirely hypothetical. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service, Nebula, at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching, and have a great week!